anyone who's opened the paper recently, in the last couple of years will probably recognise possibly some of those headlines. The reason I put them up is because the financial sector and the power sector share a couple of things in common. Both of them provide great tools to change the world we live in, to change our societies. The financial world has brought innovations such as the common unit of account, um, the uh, uh, life insurance, and also it has brought um, the joint stock company. Now, without some of these innovations, we would not be living in the capitalist world we live in today. We'd probably have, be living in a barter agrarian economy. Whilst the financial sector has brought great benefits to society, it can also bring great harm. And these headlines reflect the harm that some of these tools that the financial sector has generated, has caused recently to our societies. I would argue that these powerful tools have been misused for decades, but the issues have only come to a head over the last couple of years. So what has happened? Basically, there's been a, a credit bubble. The credit bubble has taken almost a generation to build up. The first graph that I put up is a chart of US public and private debt um, for the last uh, 100 years. You can quite clearly see that it's at a peak. In fact, this chart, this graph, um, is up to 2007, and uh, you may not be pleased to know, but that's, that continues upwards, and it's knocking 400% uh, percent, uh, total debt to GDP number. That's the last 100 years. And government debt is doing the same thing. So the last chart was public and private, and just looking at government debt, since the, uh, uh, the start of the, uh, uh, since uh, 17, um, 1790, this is the debt buildup for, uh, across US history, um, there's a peak during an exceptional period of deficit spending during World War, uh, World War II. And again, this chart is a couple of years out of date because uh, that, uh, that line has moved through the 100% uh, of GDP number and it's approaching 110. So I would imagine then uh, in a couple of years time, it will have exceeded, the, the, uh, the uh, debt, um, public debt to GDP would have exceeded um, the, uh, the limit that uh, the US had uh, during, uh, during the height of World War II. Um, the problem about this debt build-up, it's not just happening in the US, it's across the entire developed world. It's across uh, the public sector and the private sector. Um, and the trends recently show uh, no sign of abasing. Uh, this is uh, the industrial world uh, over, the last, uh, over the last decade, again, all the lines are pointing up. And again, uh, government debt, specifically government debt, again, and this is since the advent, this is since the start of the financial crisis, uh, you will notice that the financial crisis has not stopped the, the growth in uh, government debt levels across the developed world. In fact, the US seems to be, uh, 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 it almost seems to reflect the mean across the uh, um, OECD uh, group of nations, group of economies. So what happened in 2008? Basically, the bubble burst. Um, and when the bubble burst, the issue about the bubble bursting is that loan collateral became severely impaired. This put the banks in severe financial position the first, uh, the first order of the day for, um, uh, for the regulator um, was to save the banking system. Now, I'll distinguish possibly between saving the banking system and saving the banks. That's a rather thorny issue, which should be, uh, we should leave that for another day. But um, um, the other thing that happened in 2008 is the debt, uh, debt economics changed. Um, by that, I mean that up until 2008, there was this rather virtuous circle where the economy uh, took on more debt. The illusion was the economy had grown and had capacity to service that debt and also had capacity to take on more debt. Now, that virtuous upward spiral has changed and we're now in, in the reverse. We're now in a virtuous downward spiral. So the more debt that's added to the economy, particularly government debt, the more weight, the more burden the private sector experiences and the slower, the, uh, the slower private sector growth um, becomes. So the, the dynamics have changed. We, we also have, continue to have across the developed world an issue about the solvency of the banking system and there's still a need to recapitalize it um, and the pressing need over the medium term is to delever the economy now delevering de de the economy basically means that you have to reduce debt relative to the size of the economy and uh, it also means you have to increase the size of the economy relative to debt if you just focus on uh, on one of those things and one of those things alone you get into a rather uh, a rather dangerous argument actually now the problem about this <laughs> Um, and it's a serious problem, is there's no single policy nor clear tested strategy to resolve this. So what can we now expect? The central case in terms of what we can now expect come from, comes from a, 
an excellent piece of work conducted by two, uh, uh, two uh, uh, economists who studied over the last 800 years, studied every financial crisis and tried to, to if you like, average out and come up with the, the characteristics of a, if you like, a common pathology. So with that in mind, what can we now expect if you believe, if you accept the work of Reinhardt and Ragoff, you would expect to see the following play out. So this is, this is our outlook using this central case. Um, you would expect to see a long period of deleveraging um, following a financial crisis. You would expect there would be no quick fixes to the, de de the deleveraging process. You would expect that, that process to be painful, last six or seven years on average. Uh, GDP would contract in the first couple of years and then recover. You would expect recoveries uh, to be shallow. You expect growth to be weak. You would expect recessions to be more frequent and you would expect to have plenty of bumps in the road. You should not expect the usual business cycle. This is a completely different, uh, uh, different matter. So if you're a corporate executive, don't plan your affairs based on, uh, on, on, this, uh, uh, on this conforming to a, a, the normal business cycle. It's not going to do it. Um, the other th the, with respect to bumps in the road, um, this is part of the problem because high debt le levels uh, limit our ability to meet, the, these ch uh, to meet challenges, and there are plenty of them. Um, with respect to economic imbalances, we have uh, we have uh, on the immediate horizon we have sovereign solvency issues in Europe, um, and further afield we have potential major solvency issues in other OECD economies such as Japan. I mean that that is going to Japan's going to have a serious problem within the next decade. We continue to have solvency issues with the uh, a global financial system, and because it's all connected together, if a bank fails in Milan, it may pull a bank down in Geneva. That could cause a bank failure in London. Uh, which caused a bank failure in New York, and that uh, bank failure in New York becomes an issue for the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Treasury, and ultimately the U.S. taxpayer. So everything's, everything is bound together. Um, we also have uh, issues to do with sustainability of the Euro project, um, and whilst there are many immediate economic issues here, the problem about the, the, the sustainability of the Euro, Euro project is that, um, is that um, after a decade of uh, differential growth, you basically have baked into Europe a massive structural, um, uh, uh, structural um, um, unemployment differential between north and south. We've got the usual sort of geological hotspot issues to deal with and, and the, the usual set of Malthusian resource constraints. So what's been the policy response so far? Best, I think the best way to describe this is fluid, actually. But um, um, in a macro level, got to, you know, got to keep the uh, banking sector going. So avoid bank about bank solvency crisis, avoid a debt deflationary spiral, that's a lesson from the 1930s, use all, um, use all monetary and fiscal policy tools to stimulate economic growth. Um, and the other, the other issue about the problem we face today is that this is a global crisis. So devaluing your currency to stimulate exports will not work. That's another lesson from the 1930s. Um, now, I hope you can't read that because that really is, is, is what's the list of uh, of policy measures that are, that are currently being conducted and uh, may be conducted. It's basically a cornucopia of three-letter uh, three abbreviations. So I'll move on. This is, um, so the consequences of the policies that have been ensued so far are pretty clear. Over the last six years, government debt across the OECD group of nations has expanded by 50%, and central bank balance sheets have expanded at an, an alarming rate as well. Um, this chart shows the bank balance sheets of Germany, France, UK, and Switzerland. Um, that's the ECB and the Federal Reserve. So they're all at it and doing the same thing. They're expanding their balance sheets. So what does this actually mean in, a, in, in the broader sense? This basically means that, that the, the malinvestments of the previous credit cycle um, are, are, being, are basically being passed to the taxpayer um, and they're becoming socialized. They're being passed to the taxpayer and they're being borne by the currency. And it's a socialized, it's the uh, it's the, uh, the socialization of, of bad investments. That is, that is effectively what these charts are saying. Um, so what happens if the middle case, uh, if the central case does not hold, um, and you've got to, if in the investment world, if you have fiduciary responsibilities to investors, you've got to, you've got to ask some very serious questions. Uh, if, they, if they don't hold, then uh, unfortunately we face, face some very grave economic and political consequences. Um, uh, we, hope three, we hope that we will muddle through all these problems and it may take five to 10 years, but we will muddle through. Um, but if we don't muddle through, the two other scenarios are distinctly 
uh, distinctly alarming. Um, they, they basically fall into two camps. One is widespread uh, default and deflation, and the other one is run runaway inflation. Now, under those two scenarios, you would expect a very se uh, severe contraction in GDP, extensive destruction in real wealth, material uh, contraction uh, of the welfare state, and the political dimension is, is uh, problematic as well, because you may, you may see the middle dropping out of politics. Now, just on that last point, what politics will follow if we fail? Um, this is, I think probably everyone is aware of this, this just shows the unemployment rate in the EU and the US. Um, uh, I would broadly say, particularly with respect to the US, we're still muddling through. In Europe, well, until probably uh, you know, this week, you could say the Euro, uh, that Europe was muddling through, or doing a worse job of it. Um, but just, let's, let's look at Spain. Um, this is the unemployment rate in Spain. 24% um, is the unemployment rate in Spain. And uh, within the, uh, the under 25 uh, um, uh, year uh, 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 group, it's up to 50%. Um, that has political consequences. So the point is that um, growth is the only solution. And, um, well, not the only solution, but it is a major solution. It is definitely, it has to be part of the solution. And something to bear in mind here, um, which is a fact that if you put two economists in, in, in the same room, they, they will agree on, is that. Uh, is that th there is an immutable law of debt, debt economics. It's not going to change. And that is you can grow yourself out of any debt problem. Um, and the question then becomes, what is the growth rate? Um, now, current growth rates um, use certain assumptions, such as productivity gains year on year will be one you know, in, in, in an in a, uh, economy in roughly steady state will be 1%, 2%. Um, I argue that given the debt problem we face now, that is not going to be enough. Um, I'm arguing that we need a step change in productivity. We need a step change in, uh, in growth. Um, and I'm going to propose that these great, this great advance in productivity that we need to overcome our debt burden um, is, uh, can be delivered by, uh, by a, this, this, the, uh, the steam engine of the 21st century. It has to be of that magnitude. Um, now, just a, the power of innovation um, most important thing is be optimistic. Um, let's just uh, pause for, um, you know, based on uh, the previous point, where, which was um, given where we are with respect to our debt burden, um, what can we possibly do to, uh, to overcome it? So here's a, here's a thought experiment. Um, let's look at uh, energy markets. Um, uh, they're, they're of huge importance. They provide the power to industrial production. They, they provide uh, energy for the transportation of goods um, um, uh, for global trade. Uh, they're enormous. Um, they drive booms and busts. The, the price of oil has definitely dry, uh, driven the recessions and, and, uh, uh, and boom periods. Um, so let's, let's think about this. Um, what if, if power was modular, clean, clean, transportable, and a fraction of current costs? Um, next, uh, now what would be the cost of transport fuels, cost of mining, milling, refining? What would be the cost of cement and steel, ethylene, shipping, global trade? What would be the leap in global productivity? What would be the leap in global growth? What would be the impact on our debt problem? And, and if you look at the world through, um, look at the world through uh, green tinted uh, glasses, what would be the cost of, uh, uh, of um, neodymium, iron bore and magnets? The cost of lithium ion batteries, what would be the relative cost of a hybrid against an internal combustion engine car, what would be the cost of waste disposal, uh, waste disposal, recycling. What world would we live in if we had clean, cheap, modular power? What world would we live in if we do not? What world would we live in if we do not innovate? And probably the most important one, the one that uh, concerns we, me most, is what world will we live in if we do not seek to innovate? I don't, I don't classify innovation as, uh, as um, the next best way to capture the online consumer click. It seems to have captured the, uh, uh, the venture capital industry uh, for the last 10 years. We need a different form of innovation. We need innovation in the way we deliver power to our economy. So um, how, how do we learn to stop worrying? Worrying about our debt problem, and it is a serious worry. Um, we innovate. Uh, we do it quickly because the debt clock is ticking. Thank you very much. And I have some references. Yes, sir, the right here. Uh, yes, so uh, 
One of the most important things to people in this room probably is trying to find funding for starting up thorium energy product projects. And I'm wondering what do you think would be the best source to look to? It seems like the established energy companies maybe not so not so good, maybe uh, outliers of some kind that may have funding that would be uh, good to help, help us move forward. There are two sources of funding for a project. One is um, from the financial sector, uh, financial investor, and the other one is strategic investor. Uh, it's my personal view, view at the moment, given how early this, this technology is perceived to be in the financial community, that you're more likely to get um, funding from a strategic investor, so you know, an industrial company. Um, the, you know, when this type of project is mentioned to you know, those with capital, they, they gravitate immediately to the regulatory environment, and they suck their teeth because the regulatory environment basically needs them within five minutes to do a back of the envelope calculation and view the business model to be extended over 10 to 15 years. Now, you know, financial types want a, want a clearer return in a shorter time frame. So that could change, it could change very quickly, but that, I think, in, a, in the most general sense, is where the financial community is at the moment with respect to, if you like, funding the, the, the research and development and commercialization of a multiple sort reactor. I think the strategic, the, the strategic investors the, the uh, utilities of the world, they, they understand the potential and their planning horizons uh, are much longer than the investment horizons of the, the, the uh, financial sector. So, I mean, that's, that's it all.